So any, any advice for you know, aspiring entrepreneurs, maybe working in, uh, not competing with you, obviously, but uh, working in a different vertical uh, in this telehealth space? Uh, don't do healthcare would be my first advice. I think <laughs> it requires a ton of startup capital because you have that additional taxes. You basically like, it requires more capital because doctors are expensive and, you know, working in healthcare regulations is expensive, yeah. right? On the flip side, it's the most fulfilling work I've ever done. I literally got a text message from someone the other day saying like, I adopted a cat. I was allergic to the cat when I got it. I was going to take her to the pound. And I've been like, I got on your treatment and I have kept the cat for years now. Right? Oh, wow. Like, yeah. That is just... I never got that when I was an like engineer. Impacting people's like lives, a, yeah. Like <laughs> really, like company. really making a difference, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Ignite Podcast. Uh, today we're delighted to have Akash Shah. He's founder and CEO of Winley, a YC21 startup uh, that we unfortunately didn't invest in, but uh, I'm sure we will at some point in the future. Akash, welcome uh, to the program. Thanks so much for having me on, Brian. I'm really excited. I think we're going to have a great time today. Yeah, thanks for coming on. Uh, would love to get an intro from you for the audience. Absolutely. So like you said, I'm Akash. I'm the CEO and founder of Windly. And what we do at Windly is we fix your allergies for life. And the way we do that is by figuring out exactly what you're allergic to and then helping your body build a tolerance. So the same way that you can build a tolerance to caffeine, you can actually build a tolerance to cats, dogs, pollen, all the stuff that you breathe in that makes your life just worse every single day. We went through Y Combinator in 2021. We raised a small seed round, pre-seed round. It's funny, the delineation there, because YC rounds, they call them seed, but they're really pre-seed. They're really like think... really overpriced, overgribed pre-seed rounds in most cases. Sometimes they're seed, you know, like it depends on your definition, but you know, pre-seed used to mean like pre-launch, pre-revenue. Yeah, uh, like 10 years ago. Now it means post-launch, post-revenue. So exactly. now like the angel friends and family round is pre-launch, pre-revenue. So YC companies, sometimes they pivot and, you know, they pivoted six weeks ago and they're raising, you know, two one twenty or something like that. And you're like, what? You just pivoted six weeks ago. You have no revenue. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's exactly why I'm not <laughs> sure exactly what round we wait, or YC <laughs> round. We'll leave it there. And yeah, there we're doing really well. We're really happy. We've treated thousands of patients. We've helped millions with our educational content. You know, you can find us on YouTube and TikTok. And just my co-founder doing the same thing he did to me when I started the company, because I came to him with my really bad allergies. I was like, please explain to me why my life sucks. And he's like, well, it's because he can't breathe. And I was like, this is great. We should put it online and see who else has this problem. So that's a little about me, a little bit about how we got here. Really interesting origin story here, which is you were suffering from allergies. Maybe you can unpack that a bit. Yeah, absolutely. Right. So allergies, I had always thought, and this is what everyone thinks, is like you just kind of have to live with them and you take a Benadryl or you take a Claritin and then that's all right. you got. And actually, those are basically Band-Aids. They just kind of cover up the symptoms, but they don't heal your root cause, Right. So you're just choosing to stay sick whenever you take them. When you go and actually see an allergist in America, they're able to say, actually, we can fix the root cause. We're going to use this exposure therapy, which is known as allergy immunotherapy, to fix your immune system, to make it so that your allergies don't get triggered as much. And then you don't need to take antihistamines forever. I had effectively either ignored my health or taking these antihistamines for five or six years after graduating college. And I was like, this is enough. I can no longer sleep well. I can no longer breathe well. It's actually affecting my day to day in a way which is making my life measurably worse, right? It was also making my wife's life measurably worse because I was snoring. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So she's eventually like, hey, we got to get this taken care of. I start looking into it. And it would take me months and months to go see an allergist. And their treatment involves coming in every single week for five years. I can't do that. Who can do that? Who has the ability to go in every single week for an hour long appointment for five wow. years? Wow. Um, five years. That's a long time. So that's crazy. I didn't do it, which is apparently yeah. very common. I'm complaining about this at Thanksgiving. My whole extended family gets together. And I'm like the one person in my family that didn't go into healthcare. My little sister's a doctor. My dad's a doctor. My mom's works in the dental industry. It's all over the place. And my cousin is like, actually, I can fix you. I was like, thanks. How do we make that happen? 
he has a allergy and ENT practice in Denver. I live here in New York City. We jump through the hoops and he's basically able to make it so I don't have to take an antihistamine after just a few weeks. And I'm telling him, okay, well, what happens if I stop now? He's like, if you stop now, your symptoms will come back. But if you stay on this treatment for three years, you'll have effectively lifelong relief. I was like, this is great. I'll keep on it. And that's also when I realized that like, look, if this is so good, if this is so life-changing, there has to be other people out there that want this. And the way I tested that market demand is we were just, we actually went to the one place that people shout their health information into the air. And that's Reddit. So we went on to Reddit, we started answering people's questions. And what we saw was, yeah, there were enough people that were willing to just take a chance and sit down with my co-founder as a doctor to kind of gain some market traction, like gain some customer demand. And we kind of kept building on that. At about 20 patients, we actually applied to Y Combinator and Y Combinator got us in. And with Y Combinator, we were able to, we were just able to scale very quickly from being a one doctor kind of operation to building out a team across all 50 states and just move a lot faster. That's amazing. What was the, what was that process like? Did you expect to get into YC? It sounds like this is a kind of a non-traditional YC company. I mean, I don't know what a traditional Y Combinator company is. I think Y Combinator has a tendency yeah. of taking flyers on founders a lot more than like larger funds tend yeah. to. Um, and they kind of do that because look, you the get into YC often application. Processing. Yeah. Yeah. You, you do an application and then you do a 10 minute interview, right? They're they're just managing their risk, uh, risk reward there. Yeah. You know, I think what they probably saw is a doctor and a family member, right? My cousin's the doctor, I'm his family member, a doctor and engineer who were like able to find market traction and do some sales. So it's worth kind of taking that jump. Y Combinator was incredible because what Y Combinator did for us is they were basically like, look, here's some capital to get started with. Now you can quit your job and get healthcare, yep. uh, health insurance specifically. Um, Do here's they a provide that for founders. Like you buy into their pool of health insurance or something. Well, they give you $500,000 now. Right. So you're allowed oh, to use some right. of that to make sure that like you can take personal risk, basically right. <laughs> the sidebar. I think one of the biggest blockers against entrepreneurship in America is the fact that health insurance is tied to your employer. That's crazy. So yeah, that is Two such years a, ago when I left to do team ignite full time, you know, we went from some of the best healthcare in the world through Microsoft all paid for, which was probably a $2,000 a month plan. So, you know, no deductible, like, you know, no money out of pocket, HSA, the whole deal to, you know, a major medical policy with a huge deductible, $7,000 deductible for 1200 a month or 1400 a month. <laughs> that's, that, that's crazy for a family. Like so starting a company, like, you know, venture capital firm is, is a company and I have income and expenses and you know, $15,000 a year, fifteen twenty thousand $20,000 a year of my income goes towards health insurance, not even good health insurance, catastrophic, major medical high deductible health insurance. It's crazy. Yeah, absolutely. And that what those exact thoughts are basically, I think what goes through so many people's minds when they're like, should I take the leap? Should I start a yeah. company? Should yeah. I just do something on my own? It doesn't even have to be like a startup. It's like, do I start a barber shop? Do I start a cupcake shop? Mm. Right? Yeah. I think like there's nothing more rewarding than kind of running the your flip own side company. of that argument might be like, well, we also don't have super high taxes like they do in like Scandinavia or Europe or Canada that pays for that health insurance. Right. I mean, you know, if what's what what percentage of our GDP is spent on healthcare? It's like 15 percent, something like that. So we'd have to tax uh, another 15 percent of our GDP to pay for health insurance. But maybe you could argue it'd be that's cheaper. That's true. This is a whole podcast. <laughs> <laughs> it's a whole podcast. That's, that is definitely not. I would say there is a lot of like misapplied spend when it comes to the healthcare system in the yeah. US. And assuming yeah. like it's a one to one change is probably not the right analysis. Um, also, apparently, you know, $15,000 a year, you're already paying a tax for health insurance. That's it. Uh, yeah. What does this care model look like? What is it? How is it delivered? And it's across all 50 yeah, states. Yeah. So, what and, we yeah. do, well, I was saying a little bit like what Y Combinator unlocked for us. What they yeah. really unlocked is a way to like go across all 50 states. And the way they did that is people just open up your emails and take your calls when you say you're a Y Combinator backed startup right. versus like a doctor and an engineer trying something new, right? Yeah. They give you a little bit of credentialism. They give you a little bit of that. Stamp of approval. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Open exactly. doors. A stamp of yeah. approval. That's like, oh, I should take this call. 
So that's what really let us go. Like that's what let us expand so quickly. Right. And you can also just like mine that network. You can say, okay, this person doesn't have the answer, but they'll get me one step closer to the answer. Right. And so you kind of mine the network until you do get where you need to go. So what, like Y Combinator did that, they expanded our care model. They made it so, hey, it's not just everyone seeing my co-founder as a doctor and I don't need to get my co-founder 50 state licenses. We were able to use that network and find these five, 10 doctors that we work with today so that we have full coverage across America. And what happens if you have bad allergies, what you can do is you can come right to Windley. You can buy our allergy test. We'll ship it to you. You take the allergy test, you ship it to our lab. You get a free doctor's review and consult. So you sit down with one of our doctors for 30 minutes because I wanted to make sure that people got the type of healthcare that I would feel proud providing. So you get 30 minutes with a the doctor. They're not trying to cut you off. They're actually sitting and listening to you. Um, and then we say, okay, you're a fit for our immunotherapy and our treatment subscription, in which case you're going to go forward with us. You're going to get the treatment. Uh, it's going to come in a box like this and a little dropper like this every month. And then just take it underneath the tongue and eventually wow. your allergies will go away. That's amazing. Um, so this is this is like kind of related to is it traditional exposure therapy, but it's just delivered right to your door. Yeah, what we've done is taken the treatment that you would get in a doctor's office and made it like uh, e-commerce. Sa yeah, e-commerce. E you sassified it basically. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's I a subscription that. in a doctor's office too, because you have to do something yeah. every week for five years. You're still paying for it. It's been very There's lots interesting. of really good examples like this of this like kind of right time for this three or four years ago, right? Because now people are more used to get going to hims and getting their hair treat loss treatment or hers and getting like whatever the estrogen replacement therapy people are more used to almost taking a little bit more active uh care and shopping around for better services for a better price and i would assume this uh, are you guys kind of like is does insurance cover this or how does that work yeah we can take insurance we also offer like an out-of-pocket model we found that most people don't know how to fight their insurance. Insurance might come at them with a surprise bill. Um, for example, if you have a $7,000 deductible, our treatment, like you're not gonna hit your deductible. So we'll, you might as well take our out-of-pocket price and it'll actually be cheaper than going through your insurance, right? Yeah. For example, you might have to pay through your insurance $150 out-of-pocket anyway, we're only $100 out-of-pocket per month. And wow. we're a lot more accessible, right? So basically the thesis was, Doctors' offices are successful businesses. People want to buy stuff online, just like you said, Brian. So then how do we kind of build a specialty practice that takes advantage of, like, it's just, you know, the margins make sense, the treatments make sense. Yeah. And what's very interesting is when you increase access, you also increase demand. And that's kind of what we've seen, not just in healthcare, but basically everything well you basically right? grow the you grow the market right it's kind of like uber exactly. with rides like oh well how, how big's the taxi market well that's the wrong question yeah how many people need a ride right how many people suffer yeah. from allergies and you know what is that number how big is that market yeah so one in three people have allergies wow that's a ton right and this is the type of stuff that they're just kind of suffering day in and day out even if you say like, well, only half of them have it for a year round, that's still one in six, uh, millions and millions of people that we need yeah. to fix. And there's just not enough allergists even to serve this population, right? There's only like 3000 practicing allergists in America, 3000 allergists for about a hundred million people. The numbers don't line up, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what we really, I think what's been really exciting for me is by increasing this act just by increasing access to information, right? right? We had my co-founder. I started just recording the video visits he was doing with me and putting them on TikTok and on YouTube, just because he was answering like questions that I knew we were going to get over and over, right? Like, mm. well, how does the therapy work? How long do I have to be on the therapy? Can you actually fix a cat allergy? That type of stuff. I just started right. putting that on YouTube and we reach millions and millions of people every year. Right. And yeah. just by seeing those, the way people are interacting and leaving comments, I can see that like, this is information that was locked behind a specialist doctor's visit. And you were never going to get to that specialist, right? Cause it's going to be months and months of waiting because the supply and demand of allergy care just weren't there.
the demand is definitely there. We're trying to increase the supply and then capture that, uh, capture that demand for ourselves. I love this. Yeah. And we have another portfolio company called Piction Health that came out of Techstars. Uh, they're doing this in dermatology. Susan, the, the co-founder was on the pod a few episodes ago, uh, but kind of the same model, right? There's only so many dermatology uh, doctors around, dermatologists, and lots of people have skin conditions. And turns out if you reduce the friction of getting care and uh, receiving care, uh, you grow the market uh, yeah. and people end up using a, a lot more dermatology gets done. So it's similar here, you know, by uh, opening up uh, and reducing the friction of, of getting the allergy tests and getting the, the treatment needed to treat those allergies, you've grown the market substantially from, what'd you say, 3,000 allergists? Uh, you know? <laughs> yeah, 3,000 allergists that can maybe treat like a million people a year. Yeah, um, and you got to go all the way down to the doctor's office, you know, one hour a week, you said, or is it a month? It's an hour a week, right? Because, you know, you go you to go the doctor's down, office, check you in. sit down, you check yeah. in. Exactly, right? And I think people are valuing their time a little more. They don't want to run these like ad hoc errands just because. And like, imagine if you have kids, you're going to drag your kids around to the doctor's office every week. You already yeah. got soccer practice to take them to. Right. Oh, try having There's three kids in your today. 40s, like I'm, where I'm at. Like, it's just a constant struggle. I, yeah, I exactly. like it's like it's literally three kids all need to be three different places multiple times a day <laughs> it's constant. we're pretty like uh you know fifteen thousand miles on our car driving in our neighborhood you know just, oh. just, just back and forth <laughs> it's crazy you just need one of them to get their driver's license and then you'll have another thing to be worried about <laughs> yeah do you guys yeah. um what are some of the challenges that you guys faced along the way like in delivering this care and kind of scaling it up yeah, I think, look, healthcare is slow to adapt for a lot of reasons. And all of those reasons come down to you can't play games with people's health. Yeah. That's 100% something I very strongly believe, right? If you think about it, like, we see social networks, like, come up and go away in, like, a few months. Uh, but that's okay. No one is, like, significantly hurt when the social net, like, the image sharing app they're using goes away. But... When kind of an inconvenience. Promise, yeah. It's an inconvenience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but when you're like promising someone, hey, I'm going to be your doctor, we're going to get you medicine, you need to take this medicine this way. There's a lot of protections to make sure that the patient, the end user doesn't get into any trouble. That's why we yeah. have the FDA. That's why we have the FTC. And that definitely slows down how quickly you're able to iterate. At the very beginning, there was a lot of discovery around like, and when I say a lot of discovery, this means I paid a ton in lawyer fees. <laughs> uh, There's a lot of lawyer fees around. Like, how do you get even set up across all 50 states? Right. How do you make sure that you're doing that appropriately? How do we make sure that we're meeting every state board's guidelines for how you're supposed to manage these patients? Yeah. And these are questions that, like, if you're just a single doctor's office, you're never going to experience. So there was a lot of work there. This is where my co, you know, finding and being partnered with a subject matter expert in a field like this is so important. You know, my co-founder is a doctor. He was doing this treatment in his office. I could rely on his knowledge a lot. Yeah. What we've eventually set up, and it took us like two years to get here, is like just very hard and fast guidelines on this is where we're allowed to experiment. This is where we're not allowed to experiment. Right. Mm. And so that way, you, you know, because I think a startup is just a function of how many learnings you can get every week. We're able to say, that. okay, you know what? We I love can play phrase. around with our marketing, yeah. but maybe we shouldn't play around with like the mess, like the prescriptions that we send our patients, right? Not saying that we were just providing an example. Yeah. So yeah. you were saying you liked a, a startup is just like how many, a function yeah, of how many experiments uh, how can many you learnings? run? Yeah. How many learnings yeah, can I, you that's exactly like, what pack means, in right? like per day, experiments per day? I, I mean, love that. I think like just mathematically, you have to do it that way. Mm. Right. Because if you let's say you do a standard two month runway on your fundraise. If you're doing a experiment every month, you get 24. That's nothing. Yeah. If you do it every week, that gives you 104. OK, that's really good. But that means every week that goes by, like one percent of your life just fell off of your startup's life, not your right. not your actual human life. Mm. So, yeah, you need to have like sometimes I'll see people like, oh, yeah, we do one month sprints. And I was like, what do you accomplish? All right. Right. Uh, we, we try and set what we've set up here is like basically try and get two and three things out the door every single week and just make sure they're generally aligned with where we're going because just by learning, we're going to 
figure out so much yeah. more than just by trying to make sure we're going the right direction at all times. And you never know where like, oh yeah, we had this failed experiment, but we learned so much and actually we can repurpose it in a different way. Yeah. Looking yeah. back, a, a lot of what I think about as a, as an investor is like the timing, right? Obviously you guys are a great team, you know, check the box. You guys got into YC. They don't accept like bad teams typically, <laughs> you know, then you got the market, right? It's a big market. It's kind of underserved. There's lots of friction, but like, why do you think it was the right time for this? Why wasn't this done 10 years ago? you know, one or 20 years ago for that matter. Yeah, exactly. I think the biggest one is, you know, you hear about like product market fit. And I think where that that's like when people who are using your product are using it regularly and enjoy using it. But there also kind of has to be, I think like, like your market has to be able to like engage and understand how to get to your product. Right. Mm. So it's kind of like what you said, we went through the pandemic, people understand telehealth. That's it. Right. Yeah. 10 years ago in 2014, I'm going to see my doctor online. People would think you're crazy. Nowadays, yeah. the HSA is having such high deduct between like ins uh, insurance plans, having such high deductibles between people becoming much more comfortable with telehealth between very specifically our allergy test being something you can do at home instead of previously you had to go into a doctor's office. Um, this was an innovation that happened around 2018, 2019. Those were three fundamental changes that unlocked this opportunity. So I, I think you're right. Like good team, good team and good market. I would say if you have a good team and a good market, you could probably find a company. Do you disagree? Yeah. No, I think that's the whole YC positioning, right? A lot of times they don't like your idea or they think your idea is okay, but they really like the team. Um, and then, you know, I don't know what the stats is, but you know, I meet with almost every YC company, every batch and, it feels like 30, 40, maybe even as high as 50% pivot in the program. You know, they kind of come in, they, you know, I just saw one, right? We're doing, you know, AI for QA. It turns out that's really hard, but we're going to pivot and we're going to try to use this technology in a new market, new space. Well, I think yeah. that goes back to what I was saying earlier about how quickly are you learning, right? If you think of Y Combinator as you get like three months to figure out what's going to make you a billionaire and you're never going to get that opportunity again, which yeah. for many people, that's exactly what it is. I would say for everyone, that's exactly what it is. Then you have, I think like, it's a good sign actually that people are willing to throw away something that they know isn't working. Right. Because even as yeah. a VC, you probably want to look for fast growth. You don't want someone who's going to take, you know, 10 years to get to $2 million. I have a story about that, actually. I had, a, I had a team, really great team out of Google, YC backed in the consumer space. Consumer is really tough, <laughs> as you know. And, um, you know, they just weren't iterating fast enough. And I could, I could tell, like, the velocity wasn't there. Velocity is one thing we look at. And then I looked at the, um, the growth, right? That also wasn't there. And I'm like, what are you guys doing to grow? Tell me about the experiments you're running, right? Just like you're saying. And uh, a month later, they returned capital, shut down the business. They, they weren't experimenting. They weren't trying to build, ship, and learn, right? They were just kind of, I don't know, collecting their salary and, you know, treating it like a Google kind of job where you can work 30, 40 hours a week and do one experiment a week or something. They weren't grinding because it is a grind, right? To find that product market fit and, and grow the business. You can't you know, do one experiment, a sprint, like you said, or if your sprints are four weeks long or two weeks long. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, I think it like, I think this actually, I know this most from context of startups, but my wife is a published author. She's got four books out and one coming out next, next year. I have a friend who is a full-time content creator on Instagram and TikTok. And I think that whatever you're trying to build, whether it's your company, but you know, whatever it might be, it actually just comes down to like how quickly you can make things happen. Every successful person, and you hear about this like on YouTube and on Instagram, you even hear about this with Olympians, with the Olympics going on right now, like it's a grind and you have to commit mm. to the grind. I think there is a point where like, you know, working harder isn't actually going to help. Mm. But I think that point is like when you're working 80 hours a week, I don't think that point is when you're working 40, 45 hours a week. Right. I think like yeah. 80 to 100, probably not going to change much, but like 40 right. to 60, you're probably still going to accomplish a lot more. 
Um, but uh, yeah. you know, it just takes a certain type of person to be able to get like 60 hours of good work. Right. Yeah. That, and, and that's, that's a, a skill you learn. What I, what I've learned to do uh, running my own company is I, I actually don't work like the really long days, but I work almost every day and I, that, that works for me. So like, I kind of get the time in, in the evenings and I'll get some time in on the weekends and I kind of time shift my stuff around. So I'm able to get, like work at a sustainable pace without burning myself out. I find like a 12, 14, 15 hour days of pretty long day for me, you know? Yeah. Back. And also it's like something, I mean, I did a 13 hour day this past Monday, but that's definitely out of the usual. And it's just like, it's just what was required. I think yeah. you have to be able to do those sorts of sprints, but like, it's like, like you need to be able to like do a burst of speed sometimes, Yeah, but it's also going to take like five years. You should assume that it's going to take five years. Right. So you had to build a way of like, you had to be able to do it for five years. I think that's totally true. Right. I heard one of the most insidious things you can say publicly. So your competition will hear is like that you get up at 4 a.m. every day and you work all day. And so they, so they'll hear that and do the same thing and burn themselves out. <laughs> I mean, I'm not worried about my competition just because they've been trying to copy us for the last two years anyway. So yeah, tell, tell us about that. So yeah, I mean, this is uh, obviously it's going well. You guys kind of unlocked something here that's going to bring copycats competitors how do you guys maintain uh your advantage and your moat uh around these copycats? yeah i mean my favorite yeah. thing is just like this is a emerging market right this isn't like even if this wasn't an emerging market like i'm doing it because i think i'm better than everyone else out there if i don't think i'm better than everyone else then like i should be doing something where i i do think that right yeah, I, I think like you that. just have to have that ego yeah. to like take this big of a keep risk going to keep going too, right? Um, yeah. And also like, if you're taking a big risk, like I'm not, I'm not taking a big risk for like a median outcome, you know, like you want your risk reward to match up. So if I'm taking a huge risk, it has to be for a huge reward. But like, I know that I'm just going to be iterating faster than them mm. because of how I work and how I operate. And if that's true, whenever they copy me, they're going to be copying, like a, you know, 12 iterations ago. Chasing your tail. Having, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like that's fine. And you can do that, but eventually like our compounded speed will just outpace them. I love that. And I've actually seen that happen, right? We got secret shopped by a competitor who later came, who later came out and raised a ton of money. And you know, it's been two years, their fundraise definitely affected conversations I was having back then, but now it's yeah. like, well, what are they doing? Well, you know, they had millions and millions of dollars, but they also had an over bloated team. And yeah. so they had bad, you know, cash management. Now, I don't know if any of that's true. I just know that like, whatever, they're going to do their thing. And I'm going to assume that they're going to do it poorly because if they're copying me, they have to be doing something poorly. Right. Right. Because yeah. that just means they're not on the cutting edge. I think it like ends up being a short term frustration. This goes back to like picking a big market. You want to yeah. pick a market that can have multiple hundred million dollar companies so that, you know, as a founder, you can have the exit you need. That makes it worth it. Yeah. So don't pick a market that can only sustain like one player. Yeah. That's basically it. That's good uh, advice. I don't know. So you guys are, you guys are a remote first company. Yeah, we had to be, you know, we started during the pandemic. My co-founder has three kids and he lives in Denver. I live in New York city. Our first hire was in Virginia. Like it's just built into our culture. Yeah. I think there's benefits and drawbacks and there are also benefits and drawbacks to being co-located. Right. And so it's just your choice as the founder to pick like, which do you want? And then how do you handle the flip side? Yeah. Right. So like one very obvious drawback to being co-located is you're paying office rent. And that will be a drag on your cash flow, right? And like it's literally a drag that has no tangible, no like P and L benefit, right? Right. Yeah. Well, that's fine. You can do that. On the flip side, if you're remote first, you get to say, "Hey, I'm going to hire the best people. I can get the best Wherever engineer yeah. who lives in Spain. I can get the best healthcare marketer who lives in Florida. I can get the best operations person who happens to be in the Philippines." Right. Like you just yep. get the best people wherever they are, regardless. But there's also there's trade offs the whole way through. Um, you just get to choose. I think people just need to choose what their trade offs are. I think culturally, you want to make that choice earlier because it's really painful to change it.
I also think mm. it just comes down to what the founder is the best at because most companies are a reflection of their founder. Well, and it, it, it strikes me as like you guys are a remote telehealth kind of uh, healthcare company, right? So, you know, if you live and breathe remote first culture, then you'll kind of empathize more with, with your customers and your care providers and how to do that at scale and, you know, how hard, you know, how you have to be more intentional with, with your communication and team building and, exactly. and things like that. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Intentionality and communication is a huge part. Expectation setting. It's so funny. One of the things we learned, like I had brought, we brought assumptions from our physical practice into our digital practice, right? And one of the assumptions in our physical practice was to keep people on the program and keep their compliance on their medicine. They need to see a doctor every three months. And so that's kind of what we modeled out. That's what we were offering people. Eventually what we realized is actually that's not true. Or that's not what our customers were telling us because our customers wanted to talk to our doctors a ton. But the, because we were accessible basically 24 seven, they didn't have to wait for a specific time. They were comfortable just kind of like calling in ad hoc and knowing, mm -hmm. hey, I left a message with the front desk, I will get an answer and it doesn't need to be synchronous, right? Or I texted, I emailed them, I know I'm gonna get an answer, it doesn't need to be synchronous. So, you know, that was a huge shift that we kind of discovered and like part of the reason customers in a physical office want to spend, patients wanna spend so much time with the doctor because it's hard to get that time. But we increased the access and we actually made it so they weren't gonna fight and like, you know, sit down with the doctor every, every few months. And we still offer it, you can still do it. No one's picked up on it yet. So any, any advice for you know, aspiring entrepreneurs, maybe working in, uh, not competing with you, obviously, but uh, working in a different vertical in this telehealth space? Uh, don't do healthcare would be my first advice. I think <laughs> it requires a ton of startup capital because you have that additional taxes. You basically like, it requires more capital because doctors are expensive and, you know, working in healthcare regulations is expensive. Yeah. Right? On the flip side, it's the most fulfilling work I've ever done. I literally got a text message from someone the other day saying like, I adopted a cat. I was allergic to the cat when I got it. I was going to take her to the pound. And I've been like, I got on your treatment and I have kept the cat for years now. Right? Oh, wow. like, yeah. That is just, I never got that when I was You're an engineer. Impacting people's I like lives, yeah. <laughs> like really, like company. really making a difference. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's not some next gen analytics data platform, blah, 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 blah. It's, this yeah, is like there's real like value people in that, but with, it like yeah. feels different, you know? It feels it does, different yeah. when you get that as a testimonial. But my other feedback would just be the same thing as anyone, which is get more iterations more quickly. Don't take no for an answer. Like find find a way through, right? Yeah. Be a bulldozer and get to where you want to go. Don't break any rules. That would be a big one. Um, oh, especially in healthcare. It's it's different when you're like, you know, competing with taxis. Like probably break some rules, but if you're competing with healthcare doctors, like maybe make sure you're following the regulation and don't bend the rules, right? I mean, I can't speak towards what's happening with taxi regulation enforcement today versus yeah. 10 years ago. I know for a fact in the healthcare in the last like five, six years, there's been like a major, very obvious, you know, case where people went to jail wow. because they broke the rules, right? Like Theranos, Cerebral, Ubiome, uh, Dunn ADHD, like th these things happen day in and day yeah. out because, wow. because the government knows you shouldn't play with people's health, yeah. right? And so they will investigate you. They will look at you. So, you know, be ethical, but right. Yeah. Like, kind of keep driving. I think one thing that's really interesting, actually, one risk every company I've seen have in healthcare is every company like eventually meets its incentives and the incentive of most startups is like make more money. So when you start accepting insurance or when you start selling to employers, it can be really difficult to continue prioritizing the patient. And sometimes, unfortunately, prioritizing the patient isn't even rewarded in the market, right? Like that's, that's like literally just a fact. Um, so there is definitely a, if you're like focused on just building a better experience, then having a model where like when someone leaves, it like directly impacts your bottom line. And it isn't like, basically like, what am I trying to say is like, make sure the person that pays you is the person that's using your product. That's what I'm trying to say. It doesn't have to be everyone, but make sure there is a contingent because those are the people that are going to tell you that like, Hey, you have a sharp edge here.
can you yeah. can you smooth that down and you're not going to get that necessarily when someone's not paying you right right um yeah it's sorry. uh did that make sense I can yeah yeah that. well i i think it's you know it's it goes back to kind of growth solves a lot of things like so if you're growing it impacts all the other things in your company but if you're not it's going to impact all the other things in your company as well so <laughs> <laughs> um let's uh, switch your rapid fire what's the what's the biggest challenge you've faced as a founder overall biggest challenge uh making money for the company but less blithely i would say like managing the like swings emotionally oh yeah it can, can relate to that you know when you're uh, they i think it's really difficult when you're working really hard or not taking weekends or you know you put in a 13 14 hour day and then the next day it feels like you didn't make any progress mm. or you like slid backwards because all your herculean effort ended up not mattering mm. um so i would say like managing those swings is probably the the hardest thing that was, that's within my control and how have you learned to cope like what's been some tactics and strategies um experience is the biggest one yeah right just like realizing that like oh that thing that i thought was going to kill us six months ago ended up not mattering after a year you know that yeah. like getting that perspective helps a lot the other one i think is just reminding myself of the progress that has been made because inherently when you're working on something you're going to spend more time on the broken ugly parts trying to make them pretty and you're probably not going to take a moment to look back and reflect on like, oh yeah, that thing that was broken six months ago that I fixed and hasn't like, has just been doing good work for the last six months. You're probably not going to take the time to review that. So taking a moment to reflect and like give myself perspective, it kind of like, it's a counter narrative to the uh, negative narrative that sometimes might pop up. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite book or resource for startup advice? I mean, my combinator is probably their library is probably the best. Mm. I still go back to it. Paul Graham's essays specifically end up being something that like, you know, initially I thought it was amazing because it was like the only stuff that was out there and I drank it all in. Then once I got into Y Combinator, I was like, oh, well, maybe it doesn't apply to me. Maybe I'm different. You know, two years mm. later, I'm like, oh no, everything, everything is true here. That's fun. Uh, That's funny. So, you know, there's a reason it's considered like the handbook because it's easy to read. It doesn't like beat around the bush. Yeah. Read his Love essays. That. Love that. Uh, what's a typical day like for you? <sighs> yeah. So I probably wake up around eight o'clock, um, try and get at least one hour in of you know, exercise. Then I meet with my team in the mornings. Um, so that'll be just stand-ups or whatever meetings need to happen. And I try to keep the afternoons for like getting deep on something. So that'll either be just like a long time with my co-founder or just like carved out four or five hours for, you know, whatever project I need to go deep on. Recently, it's like a very strong focus on growth because I guess it's the right thing to be focused on when you're a startup founder. Uh, mm -hmm. Then I take a break for dinner. Um, hang out with my wife, whatever like projects have to happen around the house. Um, try to spend 30, 45 minutes connecting with a human that's not just my wife. Because when I work from home, you want to get out of the house. You want to yeah. make sure you have other yeah. friends. So that'll be like family, friends, whatever. Um, then I usually get another session of work in from like 10 to 1 a.m. Oh, wow. And then I get ready for bed again. But that like that's just like my rhythm, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. It won't be everyone's rhythm. I'm kind of a night owl as I well. will say I, I like to stay up late and get work done. I'm the same. I will say one thing which is really interesting is I find I'm able to do more work because I'm able to shape my schedule to my rhythm. So yeah. if I try to do deep work in the morning, it is exhausting. If I try to do meetings in the afternoon, it's really exhausting. And so mm. when I do that, I'm not able to get like a 10 hour day and I'm only able to do like a six hour day. Um, and like, look, I haven't found times... that rhythm for me. I, I've heard people say this before. Well, you have kids. About, yeah, <laughs> well, there is a there is a natural rhythm that people have for like what you're describing, kind of okay, meeting people, having meetings versus doing deep, kind of thoughtful work. I haven't found that for me yet. I guess I guess because I'm just always like doing Zoom calls or podcasts. Uh, I don't know. I'm just always like. It could, I mean, I think what the, the easiest way for me to like discover this was I started bunching my admin work together 
Mm. And I started putting it when I was like, this is my lowest energy time of the day. So a lot of my admin work ends up being done like late at night because the risk yeah. of a mistake is very low. Yeah. But it does but need not to get urgent, done. not important stuff that still needs to get done. Uh, yeah. All, the, all those little. Yeah. Got it. What's the best piece of advice you ever received? The best piece of advice. Don't worry about anything that's outside of your control. Probably got it from one of my YC partners, but it was like very much like you can lose a lot of emotions reading LinkedIn, reading TechCrunch, reading Twitter about other people's successes. Uh, you can lose a lot of emotions taking, you know, fundraising feedback personally, but if it's not in your control, it's probably best not to worry about it. And people generally aren't in your control. So yeah. uh, I think that's like just a good way of like making sure that you're staying focused on the right thing is like, you know, this is making me feel a certain way. Is it fair to like, spend time in these feelings or is this just like a natural is this like a natural response and maybe i should just like move on because that's what will be better for me and better for me in the long run. um how do you uh what are you most excited about in healthcare technology right now what's a what's an exciting trend look llms are game changing ai whatever it might be we finally have what might be the best way to scale personalized feedback for on a per patient level right? So mm. everyone could have some of the best healthcare in the world. I think there is going to be a ton an absolutely unimaginable amount of restrictions and safety features we're going to have to build in. And when I say we, I mean, like the industry as a whole, but fundamentally LLMs are going to change healthcare in ways that like people don't even recognize right now. Mm. Even if we say like, Hey, medicine is still going to come person to person all the clerical and operational work that goes around providing care and billing insurance, making sure people show up on time, making sure people take the right diagnostic or get the right medicine. That's huge. I was just um, reading about a hackathon by, uh, there's this um, healthcare, incredible healthcare writer called Nikhil Krishnan. He writes a um, newsletter called Out of Pocket. He did a hackathon and one of the projects was just like, it was an AI tool and all it did was call pharmacies and verify that they have the medicine on hand. Oh, wow. Right. And so that way, when the doctor writes the prescription, they will know that the patient is going to be able to pick it up. Right. And just that little bit, make sure that mm. patients get their medicine like that. Yeah. It sounds so, it sounds so like obvious, right. But yeah. it's a really big deal. And so that's like what I mean by some of the clerical stuff. So there's a lot of like operational work that goes operational and clerical work that goes into healthcare. And I think even that is a huge opportunity. And then once we get to the personalized care aspect, that's going to be a ginormous change. Like the way like your grandkids are going to be like, you used to go and talk to a doctor in person. <laughs> yeah. What's that like grandpa? Yeah. <laughs> right. So you had to get in the, your motor coach and drive down to the, hospital <laughs> your gas car what the heck <laughs> yeah that's funny how do you stay motivated i think that it comes down to two things the first off is like goes back to like getting that perspective and celebrating your wins and managing your energy that way and the second one is making sure that the work is not entirely who you are there should be some part of you 20 30 percent probably it should probably be more if it was healthy, but like starting a company is yeah. inherently an unhealthy thing to do that you're able to get some identity from that is not your company, right? So sometimes that can be being a good father, being a good son, being, you should have a hobby, just something that you do purely for yourself instead of to serve the company. Right. Um, and that gives you something to say like, hey, I, I accomplished something. I'm doing something for myself. And so I have a win today. And so as yeah. you know, there's kind of a through line. Which I, I is wrestle like, with this. It, it's, it's hard to pull yourself out of your, your job, your company, your business, your startup. And like, but you have to, you have to like, the question I kept asking myself and anybody who's listening to this podcast will know exactly what the question is. Is like, if I had a hundred million in the bank, would, would, I, would I be satisfied with doing what I just did today? Or would I want to do this again tomorrow? or do what I'm about to do tomorrow, whatever, whatever, however you phrase it. 
And if the answer is no, it's like try to make some adjustments. <laughs> try to, yeah. And sometimes that's a whole new career, a whole new business. And I've done that dozens of times to find venture capital. I never thought I'd be a VC. I just kind of accidentally kind of fell into it. Um, and what, what I'll do sometimes instead of going back to work at 10 o'clock at night is I'll just go play video games. I'll be like, well, if I had a hundred million in the bank, I'd probably go just like play Elden Ring. So go do that. Yeah. Don't, don't beat yourself up for like taking a little time to yourself every day to just do nothing and just be, yeah. you know? Yeah. And you, that goes and, back and, to what we were saying earlier, where like that last marginal effort probably isn't going to yield results because mm. When you're already exhausted, when you don't have that energy, it's not worth like. It's the, there's an 80 20 at play here, right? Like, actually, the more you compress your day and you're like, I, I have to get everything done within this time period, you start looking for shortcuts and processes and operations to try to get things done. What can I delegate? This is yeah. not value for, valuable for me. I need to get this off my plate. How do I operationalize this and get this off my plate? And as exactly. a founder, that's a, kind of like a lot of what you're doing is like, how do I delegate as much as I can? And just work on the, the, the really core stuff that the company needs. If you could have dinner with any historical figure, who would it be? Yeah, I think it's Napoleon. And not just because I saw the, the movie that came out last year. The movie did cause me to Anthony like, Hopkins? Who, who, who played Napoleon? I think it was Joaquin Phoenix. Okay, yeah, I haven't seen that one yet. Has some incredible, uh, incredible, uh, incredible scenes. That's for sure. yeah. yeah, it was Joaquin Phoenix. So, and and... Initially, I was like, like, how does he came? Napoleon is like, he didn't come from a lot. And right. he was able to rally people in an incredible way. And then with the resources that he rallied, he was able to like have a playbook that worked. And then not only that, he didn't just take over. He also instituted changes which continue to have ripple effects to this day. So like Napoleon and then probably Genghis Khan for the exact same reason, which is yeah. just like, Yes, they're conquerors, but they're more than conquerors because they've continued to have like, they've continued to have effects and you don't continue to have those effects unless you're also a state builder. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, and sometimes you'll kind of see like, so all three parts of that is just like fascinating to me. Like, how do you, how do you convince people to follow you to that extent? Right. And then not only how do you convince them, how do you leverage that effectively? Because I'm sure there are, there are many more examples of people who are able to like gather people, but then weren't able to leverage it into an outcome. And then how do you institute the changes necessary so that your changes outlast who you are? Yeah. I mean, Genghis uh, Khan is in incredible because like one of his sons, I believe effectively became in institutionalized in like Chinese history as, as a dynasty. And that's just like, that's mind blowing to me. <laughs> yeah. That's impact. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, this was great having you on. But where can uh, folks find out more about you and Windley? Yeah, I have a website. I, Windley is wyndly.com. That's the company. We'll fix your allergies. Come to us. If you want to talk to me directly, send me a message on LinkedIn. I'm very easy to contact, very easy to find. And that's like the easiest way for me to kind of like, for to make sure that you break through the, the noise of my inbox. Hopefully all those links are in the description. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank, thanks for uh, so much for coming on, Akash. I, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, Brian, thanks for having me. I think this was a lot of fun.